uh, definitely in Hollywood, there's, there's uh, the more what we call flashy <laughs> techniques, more showy techniques are shown. Um, you know, anything to uh, dramatize the situation. I, I don't think that uh, you know, s a very realistic techniques are used uh, in Hollywood. Um, it, it's unfortunate, but you know, we know what sells to the general public, something that uh, really looks good and, it's, and uh, appeals to them. The existence of martial arts is as old as man's need to protect himself. We can trace the birth of systemized martial arts back to the time of the ancient Greeks and its travel through India before the birth of Christ, then to China and Japan. By the 1800s, the day of the samurai came to an end. The sword was replaced by the gun and new sportive ways were developed to keep the tradition of martial arts alive. People all over the world have embraced the sportive practice of martial arts like judo and taekwondo. The spirit of the samurai as servants of the people lives in our military and police forces. And although sportive practice has overshadowed the lethal nature of martial arts, the need for personal protection has not changed. Like many things, the reality of martial arts is hard to find in Hollywood. It is found in those who use it in today's world. A lot of martial arts where I grew up, and you're seeing a lot of stuff in the movies and just television shows and just growing up as a kid being fascinated with it. Well, in fact, um, as a child I um, took judo, um, karate, um, a little bit later on I did uh, a style of kung called Wing Chun Kung Fu and um, even practiced Tai Chi for a period of time. Um, so I've had an interest in the martial arts for a long period of time. Uh, I went to uh, warm and water, the gym I was lifting weights, and I see this guy's uh, train over there, Marcus Lima. So I start training with him, then I, I start loving jiu-jitsu, but I always train from the whole bar. I've trained in many, many martial arts over the years and with many different instructors. Uh, I guess I started with Taekwondo and uh, trained with Aikido and uh, Aki Jiu-Jitsu and traditional Japanese karates. I've done a considerable amount of boxing, Western boxing, American boxing. I began martial arts training for the self-defense applications associated with being a special operator. Well, the reason I started martial arts uh, dates back to when I was 19 years old. And actually, I got my ass kicked at a party. Uh, and I decided after that, that, that that was enough being kicked around, you know? I have a black belt in Tang Kudo from, what I did, I took it about 12 years, from 9 to about 21. And then a little bit of boxing and kickboxing, and then I went to college, came here and got my ass whooped by a 17 year old blue belt. <laughs> you know, uh, the Bruce Lee uh, phenomenon is probably one of the biggest factors. Um, uh, you know, when I saw that and, you know, seeing the things that the, that, you know, he could do and the uh, types of people that, that uh, you know, were training and the things that they could do, I was, you know, instantly mesmerized. <laughs> and it was something that I knew that, uh, you know, I had to, to definitely um, investigate or try to get into. And I'm glad that I did. <laughs> uh, I work at Brian Moore Guitars and the head luthier here and uh, so I do everything. I work, uh, I work uh, landscaping, construction, but when I have a fight coming up, so I cut down and work, and I, I just train hard, like for this fight now, I, I only work half time. 
My name is Officer Tom Hausman. I'm a cop in the uh, city of Poughkeepsie in New York State. But I, I work now for the Community Policing Division. Uh, I'm involved in uh, training, uh, in-house training for our officers. I do uh, defensive tactics with them, and I teach in several of the uh, different county academies in this area. I'm Master Sergeant Randy McElwee, and for the last 19 years, I've served with Army Special Forces. I'm currently assigned as a military science instructor at the University of Georgia, and I'm the director of the Special Operations Combative Arts Association. About seven, eight years now, I've been doing loss prevention work. I'm uh, managing department stores. Uh, I apprehend shoplifters and things well, like that. My company is Guccione Films. I've worked with Penthouse for 20 years, and my forte is shooting naked women. And uh, we try to capture the beauty and sensuality of, of, of women, put it together with music, and bring it to the public. It's a good job. John Inkfadon, uh, chiropractor in Fishkill, New York, and playing over here at New York Martial Arts Gym in Poughkeepsie, New York. I'm Earl Ayumis. Um, I'm a second degree black belt in Nihon Goshen Aikido. I have uh, over 20 years experience in uh, Aikido. I've been training longer in the martial arts. Um, I'm one of the instructors here at uh, New York Martial Arts Gym. We've been here at this facility for seven years. Currently, I train with Gene Simcoe at, uh, here at New York Martial Arts Gym in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, I've trained in various styles of karate, uh, stand-up styles of jiu-jitsu, uh, ninjutsu. I'm president of a company that owns and operates this academy, uh, one of the largest jiu-jitsu websites on the internet, and publishes instructional materials such as books and DVDs. My name is Neil Myers, and um, I have a number of business interests and activities, of one of which is I act as a literary agent. And uh, specifically, I act as a literary agent for Gene Simcoe. I work with a publisher, and that publisher specifically was looking for um, an author to publish a book on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And um, because the author knew that I had some connections in the martial arts field, uh, I broke, broke upon the publisher knew I had some connections in the martial arts field, um, they asked me to try and find an author um, for a book on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That initially was not easy to do. Um, I found that although there were a number of famous names in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, many of them um, may have been very good fighters but were not necessarily good writers or able to describe what it is that they did. Um, others were almost uncontactable and unreachable. Um, I was lucky enough to find um, Gene Simcoe who, apart from being a very accomplished Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner, um, is one of those rare skilled martial artist who's also able to describe what they do accurately and completely and um, on top of that has a good head for business as well and two more pieces of luck was Gene already had a book two books in fact which he'd self-published um, which is always nice for a publisher to hear because they know something's been successful and the other great piece of luck was it turned out that he wasn't in Rio de Janeiro or on the west coast of the United States but just about an hour and a half drive away from where I live and um, so we established a connection, and um, I'm very glad we did. Well, NIMAG is definitely a world-known academy. We have students from all over the world, including Europe, South Africa, Brazil, and of course, the United States. Uh, we prepare students for everything from no-holds-barred matches to sport jiu-jitsu fights uh, to self-defense techniques and, of course, law enforcement. I think Gene is a great instructor. He has a knack for explaining things you know, in the simplest form so everybody can understand them. even this, from the simplest things to the most complex ideas of jiu-jitsu. It's very easy to learn from him. He takes you know, the time with every student, has a lot of patience, and seems to help everybody out an equal amount. Spends a lot of time uh, focusing on each student and uh, learning. Oh, this guy's uh, Greg Daves. He's a friend of mine. We used to train together, and he's a uh, he's new Gene. And I, the first time I came I came to Gene was uh, oh, I had a, like six month training in Jitsu, and I I trained in the gym. I come for a visit the gym, and I start training this gym. And the gym he 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 show us us two good techniques, and after that he he say 
road, the, the mat's gonna be open for you guys, you guys train whatever you need. So we train for like hour, hour and a half after that, and I, after that I say that, that's gonna be the, the gym I'm gonna train for. He's pretty good, I mean, he, tra he, he teach always uh, a good techniques, and he, he more watch me, me, me training, so he teach me what I need to, to learn. He's not really like, uh, you gotta do this technique or this technique. He go on every one and, uh, and show them the technique works for them, so I like that way. Oh, he, he's a very nice guy. I mean, he, we always joking with him. He's not even look like a fighter because he's so nice. So uh, he's a really good uh, fighter, but you know, when we talk with him, he's, uh, he's just too nice. He gotta be a little bit mean. I started martial arts when I was about 19. I earned my brown belt uh, third Q in combat karate after seven years of training. And uh, I took a hiatus after a while. I had an accident, I couldn't train anymore. And I got heavily into my work at Penthouse, and I shot a lot of Penthouse video. But I, I, I needed to get back into the martial arts. I wanted to get back into shape. I wanted to, to fight again. And after watching the UFC and watching the Gracies fight, I said, wow, what a, what a great style. And, you know, what, a, what is my style lacking, I thought. And then I knew it was jujitsu. And uh, so I went on the internet and I found... I found NIMAG, actually, jujitsu.net. And then I met G Gene Simcoe, who turned out to be like an awesome guy with a great school and a great bunch of people. And I joined. And I was really happy I did. In fact, since then, I've learned a lot. And I've found not only is it a great style, but what a great bunch of people it is to work with. Gene is, uh, is, is interesting to me from many perspectives. Um, one is, is that although he's a skilled practitioner um, at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, he primarily makes his living through teaching and publishing um, his own instructional works on Jiu-Jitsu. Um, there are many very good fighters in the field and I'm sure Gene would be the first to admit that there are a number of them that are better than him. Whether there are any better writers uh, about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I, I don't know. Um, and so um, it's an example of where um, there are many ways in which people are involved in the martial arts. Um, I was aware of the fact that people make their living in the martial arts in a number of different ways. Some have schools, um, some have a line of video or uh, DVD products, others write books. Um, others promote fighting events, others participate in those fighting events. And um, uh, the, uh, the, I suppose there are many ways to uh, interact with the martial arts, there are many, many ways to make your living in it. Um, one of the most important things that I've observed is that you know um, how your own skills and your own sensibilities fit best within the martial arts world. Um, Gene is a skillful practitioner of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but he's also recognised that he's probably um, an even better teacher and um, of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and on top of that, he has a very good sense of how to market his knowledge and um, the business world of the martial arts. Teaching allows me to do what I love full-time, uh, as opposed to fighting, where I couldn't expect to have a career that lasted more than three to five years. I mean, more and more, more not bad. I mean, like, uh, I know the same thing, you know? Yeah, more endurance and more, like, more, like pressure, keep going, you know? Keep going. My shape is like in better shape, so I mean, it's not like a, they never teach me anything, they just train me to be hard. They teach me kickboxing, so they didn't teach me well. Take it easy. Yeah, this, this people been uh, sponsoring me. I mean, they're not really paying money right now because we just start fighting. We find a couple guys, uh, it's like for the, this fight now, uh, I have a full contact fighting and sponsor me. So they're not really paying good money. I mean, I just start because I just want to fight and I just want to be to the top. I don't really think about the money right now. So you want to be to the top. So where do you see yourself in 10 years? I don't know. I think yeah, I might be... Uh, I might be stopped fighting, I don't know. I think about 5e, e, I'd be one of the best in the world. Boxing fights? Um, depends. If you do a four-round boxing match, it's like 400 bucks, like $100 a round. 
the most I got paid was uh, officially was twelve hundred bucks. Um, I get paid more now doing. I do a little promoting and doing shows like that. If I go out and box down exhibition matches, I make more actually than I was as a pro boxer. Because unless you make the big money, big time, like top fifty fighters, there's really not much money in it. You know, um, the top guys like an ESPN. You see fights in ESPN, MSG. They're getting between five and twelve thousand dollars, and that's really good boxing. That's top ten main event fighters. So unless you get to HBO level or Showtime or uh, pay-per-view, it's really hard to make a living as a pro boxer. I see myself in 10 years probably married and hopefully having children that I will myself put into jujitsu. His training regimen, we do, um, he runs during the daytime. So he'll get a run in the morning, shadow boxing, some, some drills in the bag. And in the evening, we'll, um, mostly we do a lot of boxing, kickboxing with takedowns. We do about four or five rounds that way with some good calisthenics. Some leg work, push-ups, shadow boxing, and we finish up with mostly he's defending himself on, on his, from his back. We're real comfortable with Glover on the top position, so we want to make sure he can escape and do some sweeps and get back to his feet, keep the fight in his feet as best he can. So we know we have a good fight for Glover. Um, his first fight was over a year ago. He's been training really hard for this one. We have um, real, new, real strong focus, and we're in tune pretty tight for this fight. He's fighting for the Intercontinental Light Heavyweight title. Uh, in Portland, Oregon, um, Matt Linden and Randy Couture's sport fight card. And he's fighting one of Team Quest's top submission fighters who has about four title defenses already. So we're going to go in there and see if we can come back and bring the title back to Connecticut. And he's been out there training, uh, representing the pit fight team, and he's looking really good. Did you ever get nervous before a fight? Not really. I mean, a couple times in Grappler Quest, in the Naga, like submission fights, but never in a no hold bar fight. I get a little nervous, um, just nervous and wanting to do good, not you know, wanting to put all the training to work for to lose and fight. People training for sport do so out of want. Uh, people training for self-defense do so out of need. In fact, what happened with me is I became a little bit disillusioned with the martial arts because um, they didn't answer certain problems that I felt were out there in the in the world of self-defense and some years ago I ran across something called Sistema. Um, Sistema is something that almost nobody knows anything about in this country, in fact we didn't even know it existed until about 11 years ago. Um, Sistema is, uh, is really just, a, just a, a name which in Russian means nothing more than the system given to a series of, of studies of movement which was taught specifically to elite members of the Russian Special Forces, so an elite within an elite. And it was primarily used um, by those Russian forces um, for people entering missions of the highest risk. And the only reason we come to know about it at all is because with the breakup of the former Soviet Union, um, some people came out um, from Russia, including my teacher. Um, his name is Vladimir Vasiliev, who teaches in Toronto now. And his teacher, who's still um, in the Special Forces, um, but teaches in a school in Moscow. And I ran across the, the martial arts that way. Now, I, um, that martial art is not a mainstream martial art by any means. Most people have never heard of it. And unlike many martial arts, it doesn't have belts or ranks. Um, it doesn't have um, active sporting applications or competitions. And so whilst I'm, I was interested in that art, um, there isn't really much opportunity, at least for me, to make any kind of a living from that. In fact, I make my main living um, from various business ventures, including things such as sales training, acting as a literary agent, um, acting as a direct marketing consultant. You know, I find that I learn most of the things I know by experience. And uh, I know when I get a guy in the car, the back seat is really narrow. So, uh, so a lot of the time you get them in there and they're lying down. And uh, you always have to make sure that you go 
when they start kicking, which they often do at the windows, that you go to their head as opposed to their feet. Because if you come down here where their feet are and go to open the door as I did one day, when you pull on it, if he kicks, that's when you jam your thumb because the door flies open and, and catches your thumb, which happened to me one night. And since then, I, I uh, always pull them out head first as opposed to feet first. It, you know what? On way back. I don't. I, I I can't say for sure what. Yeah. No, it's not bulletproof by any means. No, but neither is my vest. So, uh, no, the glass is not bulletproof. We put that there so so that uh, you don't spit on me as we drive down the street. That's the main purpose of that glass back there is is to prevent you from spitting or uh, or kicking into the front seat. Sometimes people get get uh, get their feet so they can kick forward or sometimes they'll slip the cuffs from behind their back to the front of them and now their hands are in front and uh, and they could potentially get their hands around your neck or something so that plastic is to prevent that as far as firearms uh, I check everybody before they get in the car and I hope that I do a good enough job that uh, I don't end up having somebody in the back seat with a gun um, as far as as far as martial arts it it, it worked go for me uh, I do martial arts for, for a number of reasons, and, and yes, one of them is for my job. Uh, 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 let's face it, uh, when everyone's running away, the police are running in, and, and you have to deal with all kinds of people at different, different levels. Um, you know, uh, people become upset, and they're in a state of uh, uh, where they're emotionally disturbed. Uh, they're, they're so angry, they're, they're no longer rational. And sometimes all the talking and the best talking in the world just just isn't going to uh, to calm them down or to make the situation safe for everybody. And uh, sometimes we have to go hands on. Before something happens, people are talking, you know, arguing, try to stop them before it happens. Yeah. That's why you want, like you said, be a deterrent, walk around, make sure nobody gets in trouble. Like, you know, that's how you stop it. If you wait for them to start fighting, the it's a lot harder, you know. Right. These guys are mostly in their 30s and 40s, so. A lot of people are so usually not too much trouble. Usually it's like a big melee, everybody goes outside, everybody's fighting, you just gotta break up one fight after the other. You know, so you're actually going from one fight to the other, breaking them up. When you get done doing that, you're tired, and you're looking, and they're all fighting again, and you're breaking it up again, you know? You know, Briar Patch, we worked here, we had uh, two bouncers. So, it was, here we have five. A lot more fighters, yeah, a lot more bouncers. And no fights. Back in the day, the funniest scrap I seen if somebody got knocked out, I don't want to say who knocked him out, but someone got knocked out. And he was about 6'5", and he got carried out by like three people. So he was like, a guy 6'5", stretched, and three people were carrying him out. It was like carrying a deer like in a forest or something. That was the funniest thing I've seen. And uh, he, got, he was in a hospital. Special Forces allows individuals an opportunity to vary their training for the mission and the circumstance. I personally supplement my training. Um, because I enjoy the training itself. I like to supplement with uh, Gracie Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and knife fighting techniques. I train with the Gracies and uh, with uh, Romero Jacare Cavalcante. It makes me uh, better prepared to do the job. It gives me a lot more options and uh, it just makes me more confident that I can deal with any situation that's going to come up. And I've, I've determined that uh, you know, the lessons from jiu-jitsu translate to all aspects of my life, whether it's personal relationships or, uh, or business things. Uh, there was a time during the first Gulf War when uh, my team was tasked to retake a Kuwaiti military base that was controlled by the Iraqis. And uh, after the firefight, we had several Iraqis that surrendered, and we were, we were trying to control them, take control of them as prisoners, and one of, them, one of them became combative and had to be restrained. I had a person one time who was uh, under the influence of, of uh, drugs, wet PCP, uh, angel dust. Uh, they were under the influence of this drug, uh, and, uh, and they thought that I had a knife and that I was trying to stab them to death. Uh, a person like that is incredibly difficult to control because he believes that I'm there to kill him and uh, he's going to do whatever he can to get away from me. And uh, uh, he was naked and he was in the middle of the street and uh, I, 
was with one other officer initially, and uh, to put somebody like that in custody or to, to, to get them to the hospital where he needed to be uh, is, is, is a real chore. A lot of people who shoplift uh, tend to be wanted for other things or uh, have records and they have no respect for people not in uniform, so they tend to want to fight quicker than they would a cop or uh, uh, you know, somebody else with authority. And uh, they go at you a lot harder too. They're not afraid to hurt you because they don't have that extra penalty that they would if they were going on a cop. So uh, it's really important to know what you're doing in those situations. And like I said, they've dominated ever since. Never had a problem. I've taken guys down 40, 50 pounds heavier than me and uh, had him apprehended safely within 30 seconds, minute, but really quickly, I've been control the whole time. I think it's very important for women to learn how to fight on the ground uh, because unlike males, females aren't as worried about being attacked by one another. They're more worried about being attacked by someone bigger and stronger. And in that case, uh, they'll end up on the ground. Um, Jiu-Jitsu is one of the only martial arts that teaches someone how to fight from their back as a dominant position. teacher carries the responsibility uh, not only of conveying technical information but of molding the attitude of each student uh, to ensure that the techniques aren't being misused. Um, you don't just put a gun in the hands of a child. Unfortunately though many schools do. I'm a big advocate of children training in martial arts. I think the byproducts of the training that they receive with respect to self-defense, self-confidence, commitment, and dedication are invaluable in today's world, especially with all the difficult challenges that they face. I think it's important to recognize their dedication and skill, but I'm, I'm in favor of a separate ranking system for adults and children. I just don't think that children possess this maturity that goes along with the responsibility of being a black belt. It's like driving a car or voting. There's just a certain amount of practical maturity that is required to truly represent. How do I feel about children getting black belts? I, 
I don't feel it's a very valid thing that that should happen. Although it's a widely accepted practice in the martial arts, um, our system does not um, uh, award black belts to uh, children who are younger than 15 years old. Um, even though that's even a debatable point, uh, I think that around that age, uh, the child or um, student is at a level that, or a maturity level that they can fully understand uh, what a black belt is and you know what those responsibilities are. Uh, but like I said, I, I feel that's even a debatable point. Um, my personal view on is that um, <clears throat> until they they are young adults, probably around that age, and that's again on a case by case basis. Um, black belts for for kids is not uh, something that I believe in. Yeah, I think uh, I think Hollywood uh, portrays martial arts in, in a uh, uh, controlled way, and uh, uh, a street fight is in no way controlled. Uh, it's it's uh, chaos and, and, and there's no rules and it's obviously not choreographed and it doesn't look flashy or pretty or, or uh, it doesn't look anything like that. It looks like um, chaos and, and uh, just, just arms and feet flailing and, and, and people rolling around. And, and, and for me, I need simple techniques that, uh, that I can execute at those times when uh, when things are really falling apart for me, and my world has has been turned upside down, I I, uh, I can't uh, for me come out with those flashy techniques at that time. They they uh, they they take too much motor skill, and and, and I, I haven't been able to perfect them to the point where where most of them uh, work for me at that point. I remember I remember once. When we went to California, we shot a penthouse video, and um, and I was kind of hungry for ideas, and uh, I was like, well, you know, what? Let, me, let me pull something from my own knowledge and experience into the shoot, and it turned out that it was martial arts, and um, so we did. In fact, we'll, we'll, I'm sure any moment we're gonna cut away to some martial arts stuff on my penthouse video. It was a lovely girl from Canada, actually, uh, Jessica. And uh, I was showing her how to hit the heavy bag. And she was really good with it. Um, she was great. She, she had a, her own little flair. So it was sexy for me, and I think for everyone, to watch her, you know, just get physical. I wanted to incorporate the martial arts into, into what I do, which is basically to capture the sensuality and the eroticism of, of naked women. That's what I do for a living. Martial arts in the movies are extremely overdone at times and very unrealistic. Real fights simply don't resemble the film versions. You know, high, high fancy moves, high kicks are just impractical and suicidal in a real fight. Most fights start quick and end quicker. And everything I've seen, it really comes down to who strikes the initial decisive blow. No, I have never had the experience of uh, what they call dim mock or death touch or anything like that. And I personally, uh, I don't believe in it. No, oh, I, I think it would take uh, uh, an extreme amount of force plus precision skills. I just don't think it's that likely with uh, you know, your bare hands in, in uh, you know, a wrestling capacity to break someone's neck uh, with just force. Uh, like I say, I su suppose that uh, it can be done with, uh, you know, highly trained uh, individuals, maybe in the military or whatnot, but I just don't think it's that likely. Given the right set of tools um, with a, and with the amount of training, or the right amount of training, I should say, um, I don't think it's that hard to kill somebody with your bare hands. I have seen some impressive knockout blows, but usually it's a result of chance precision contact and a flurry of punches. I've never seen the mythical death touch or the one shot, one kill blow that a lot of people talk about. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but at this point, I'm extremely skeptical. 
based on my experience, I believe it's not easy at all to kill someone with your hands. I think that chokes are probably the most lethal techniques, and of those, probably the rear naked strangle seems to be the most effective. You know, I think uh, one of the ways it might be possible would be to use somebody's body weight and to, you know, use the body, the weight of their body, you know, onto the head, and uh, you know, putting force into the neck, you could probably do some severe damage to the neck. But in terms of just grabbing and. Uh, putting pressure on a neck with uh, just the strength from somebody's arms without incorporating the body weight and the extreme amount of force. I don't think it's that likely. Um, I've trained in a lot of the traditional martial arts or, or a number of them and uh, is there a difference between those and, and, uh, and, and the reality? Um, I think I think they're all based in reality. Uh, sometimes it becomes for me a little complicated. Uh, the traditional arts uh, start to become uh, too complicated for me to perform under stress. Uh, when, when you're under stress, I think you lose your motor uh, uh, skills, your fine motor skills, and you lose your ability to, uh, to focus and do those fine motor techniques. Uh, also, for me, requires a lot of thought. And, uh, I found in, in, on the street, I don't have time to think. I, I've got to react, I've got to uh, act. I don't have time to think about what technique uh, I'm going to need to use for, for, a, given, uh, for a given circumstance. Uh, so, so I've tried to, to strip away the, 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 uh, the fine motor techniques and, and, and really practice three or four techniques that uh, I think from my experience work uh, consistently for me. Nothing's going to work every time, all the time, but uh, I think you can narrow things down to those techniques which, which are going to be, uh, you're going to get the most bang for your buck. And, and uh, that's what I'm looking for out of my martial art is, is the most bang for my buck. I, I feel they each have their role according to the person who takes it. Um, some people are, don't have uh, the drive, so to speak, to do something like this, and they're more comfortable with like a keto or something. And some people are into karate and things like that, but um, it matters. Uh, people take it for recreation, karate, a keto, stuff like that's fine, but prowl, practical purposes is the best thing. I've, uh, I've been in a lot of real situations before and uh, survived. And now, uh, now that I'm doing this, I've been in a couple of real situations since. I've dominated. No, no threat, no problem, no fear. It's been, confidence is phenomenal. Well, our uh, particular style of Aikido is a self-defense oriented style of Aikido. So there's no room for flash. Although, you know, I'm sure that I could show you a flashy technique. Um, no, it's, it's really about getting the job done and being able to go home at the end of the day. So no, I don't believe in flashy techniques. Definitely get the job done. Practical techniques are much more useful to us. Well, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time in uh, different martial arts schools and classes. Uh, I enjoy the exercise. I enjoy the workout. I, I think it's uh, extremely important to go and, and to get the workout and, and to have that physical activity. Uh, however, in my experience, I've found sometimes that uh, I get too much information and it becomes difficult for me to make a choice as to what technique to use at any given time. Uh, sometimes I think you'd be better off going and learning only three techniques and, and going for three months, four months, five months and just reviewing those three techniques. I think for me I'd rather go to a school where they teach three techniques and I go over them three times a week for five months than to learn 50 techniques for five months and go over them once each. Uh, that, that works better for me. From my experience I use three or four techniques on a regular basis and, and become very, very comfortable with them and, and, and they work better for me that way. Well, the thing that comes to mind that really work is a sucker punch. That works usually all the time. Two guys are arguing, one guy starts to fight about 10 seconds before the other guy does and he just hits the guy and he just lays him out. That's usually what really happens. You know, that, that works, and I see it works. 
The second thing, as a bouncer, the thing that works for me is, you know, just making sure they don't swing, grab them, and then uh, hold them, you know, clinch them up, grab them, you know, and that's it, get them out the door. But as far as what works in the fights, that's what I see happens all the time, because fights happen too quick in the bar. You know, you don't really see much. If they go outside, then it's a lot more of a street scrap, wrestling, kicking in a, in a groin, stuff like that, you know, pulling hair, biting, all that stuff. In the bar, I haven't seen any of that. Just punches, sucker punches, and people hitting each other with bottles. That's a number, that's a two, the first two. That's what usually happens. I think me, I, I definitely favor at work a, um, a, a manipulation technique a control technique over a striking technique just because uh, it's easier to control the level of damage you inflict on someone. Uh, it's not always possible to have that choice, but if I do have that choice, uh, I prefer to, uh, to use a, a controlling, uh, what they might call a wrist lock or, or that kind of control technique uh, as opposed to, to striking. I found that it's important to be skilled and versatile in the three foundational elements of uh, combatives. Striking, which includes punching and kicking, grappling, both stand-up and ground fighting skills, and supplemental weapons, primarily stick and knife fighting. I've become especially fond of the grappling aspect uh, just because of, of the effectiveness without using strength or size. And uh, it works even when you're tired, injured, and doesn't necessarily require that you're in at 100% and you perform the techniques, as long as your skill is at a high level. When I was in my 20s and I was bouncing, I got, I, hit, I hit a lot of people, hurt them. Sometimes I got arrested, I stopped doing that. Now if I grab somebody, I'm gonna try, you know, I'm gonna grab their arms, do an arm drag, get them from behind, get them in a choke, and then drag them outside. That's what I usually try to do. Or just a bad hug, pick them off the ground, throw them on them outside. Like you said, not trying to hurt nobody. You know, that's, that's the key. Because like, a place like here, I'm not here to hurt nobody, and they don't pay me to hurt nobody, and they don't pay me to get in fights. So the last thing I try to do is get in any type of hurting anybody. Because then they get sued, and then I gotta leave the job. Uh, I don't really have a favorite technique. I go for uh, back matalel, choke from the back. As far as uh, the martial arts on the street, um, I don't see I don't see a whole lot of that. Uh, but uh, I I have seen it, and I've seen some people who who used uh, traditional martial arts kicks and were very effective. But I think more times I've seen people uh, attempt that with uh, very limited success and, uh, and uh, seen those kicks fail. Uh, I saw one person uh, on an icy street attempt to kick one time and, and uh, they, they fell down because they, they uh, had shifted their balance and, and stood on one foot on an icy sidewalk and, and uh, were unable to, to use that technique. So. This forces is the modern equivalent of the samurai. The samurai used a wide array of weapons to include bows, arrows, guns, but they're most notable and what they're known for is the sword. They carried a long katana sword and a short range makazashi. Uh, Special Forces uses the M4 rifle and the M9 pistol in much the same role to give them that versatility for different ranges. The equipment uh, varies with each mission, but uh, for some missions, particularly urban combat and uh, target exploitation, it's common to wear body armor and ballistic helmets. People may think, oh, he's got a gun, he's got, he's got weapons, uh, why, why, would you need, why would you need a martial art? And, and my handgun is part of my, my martial arts and, and part of my practice and, and part of what I do practice. Uh, uh, that's that's a level of force though that's a deadly physical force and and uh, I, I only use that when I need to use deadly physical force and many 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 times the vast majority of times you're not going to resort to resort to your handgun you're going to uh, 
you're going to use a force that's less than lethal. And, uh, and, and that's my objective, is always to use the minimal amount of force necessary to, uh, to make the scene or the situation safe, to take that person into custody, or to, uh, to protect. That's my job, is, is to protect people. And, and uh, I don't want to uh, injure the, the suspect or the perpetrator any more than I have to, and I want to protect the public from the perpetrator as much as possible. And uh, a lot of the times, uh, a handgun or, or an impact weapon is, is not the answer, and, uh, and, and hands-on techniques are. Weapons can sometimes compromise reconnaissance missions, and uh, use of firearms is not appropriate in uh, every situation. Sometimes lethal force is not the right answer. And, uh, Weapons can, uh, can jam, they can run out of ammunition and fail, so it's important to be able to transition to other alternatives. The fight breaks out outside, okay? I'm on myself. So we're not supposed to go outside. So tell me, don't go outside if this fight, don't go outside. So at 42 years old, last thing we do at 2 o'clock is run outside. So anyways, they're like, go outside, go outside, and it's out there fighting. So I'm like, oh, Jesus. So then Gary was right next to me, so Gary goes, oh, now I gotta go. Gary see me, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> so we go out there, and my boy, big Ed, 6'2", 260, is on the ground. Mace, and he was Mace in the face. I didn't go down, though. No. Okay, you didn't go down. I got down. nine others with me, though. Okay, well, he had... Came back in, get water! <laughs> he did have people under him, I'll say that. But the bottom line is, my boy, Mace, and the wind was blowing at him. <laughs> <laughs> he went down like two the other bats with a hole in the way. <laughs> oh, that was the funniest. I came last. So when I came last, I got no, no spray. Camera. <laughs> <laughs> the weapon of choice. I've seen him spray. Or, and you or, spray base? No. It has one. These help. Demonstrate on carry. Come here, guys. Thanks, buddy. Have a good night, bud. Don't act that way. Right? Now that way. Inside there. I didn't see anything. Yeah, okay. I'll tell you the truth. Okay, I see that's fine. Have a good night. You too. You too. Yeah. Trevor's one of the few people that actually motivates me to keep going. No, you admire that dedication, you know? You want to get there? Pressure on his face. Why do you lay it out? You have to do right there. <clears throat> nice. Up, up, solid. Count. Seven. Stay solid, Trevor. Stay. Really not have been really hurt in training. I hurt in training a couple times when I start like for the full six months. I've been hurt, but after that, I, I'm not really. I hurt my knee in a competition, and uh, I'm not really hurt in the train no more. I mean, it's like after I come tonight, Meg, we've been training very carefully and everything. So uh, we train harder, but carefully, you know, so we know when to tap or when to, to do the thing. So I'm not really hurt in the train anymore. <laughs> Interesting question. I got a lot of friends and family just tell me to quit. And uh, even guys in here tell me to take time off and stuff. But, uh, I'm not happy if I do. So yeah, it's worth the injury. They're, they're not that bad where I am crippled, so to speak. But uh, if I take the time off, I'm just not happy. I, I don't. I carry myself differently. I think differently. I, I need this. This. I'm in this for the long haul. This is my. This is my life. So it's. It's like stopping something you love. You know. You got to do it. The day it comes and something breaks, that's when I take the time off. You know. <laughs> yeah. just sit up. Sit up. Just rotate it. Look at look. It's a lot. Yeah, it's not a. 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 It's not a.
Uh, it slips and pulls off. I've been very lucky. Frequently people do get injured and um, I've only sustained minimal injuries. I've uh, injured my lower back and my shoulder but nothing permanent. Uh, sometimes I still have some problems. Uh, I've just learned to train smarter and uh, I'm trying to maximize my training and take care of those injuries and prevent them as much as possible. I've suffered some injuries. Uh, I think the more realistic your training, probably the better it is, and I think the more realistic it is, also the more likely you are to become injured. Um, you know, you, you, you have to have a fine balance there. And it's not easy sometimes to achieve that balance, and the injury is always a possibility uh, if you're gonna practice martial art. Um, I have had injuries, I, I tore my ACL out, uh, I was wearing a, uh, what they call a red man suit, uh, doing some training with some some uh, some students one time, and uh, I have some screws in my knee as a result. Uh, I've suffered other injuries, like like anyone I think who does a sport. You're gonna, you know, you're prone to injury. You're doing a physical activity, and and, and you're gonna you're gonna get uh, some injuries. Uh, I, I think that you just have to uh, look at what you want to achieve and, and, and try to keep the injuries to a minimum and, and, and expect a certain amount of uh, uh, soreness and, and, and some sprains and, and twists and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's part of training. Practicing martial arts has definitely changed my life. It's made me a more controlled, confident, and situational aware person. The training has, has taught me to put my ego aside in order to continue to, to grow as an individual. Yeah, martial arts, and especially jiu-jitsu, which I found with NIMAG, that I found at Poughkeepsie after looking on the internet, is that it, it can really correlate into every aspect of your life. Uh, not only obviously for self-defense and fitness, but I mean every little thing you do in your life, it really comes to play. How you can, you know, how you can use that in every aspect of your life. Did for me to teach that. Uh, I argued with them because I didn't think I was good enough to teach, and quite frankly, I still don't think I'm that good, good enough to teach. But um, it seemed that there was nobody better qualified around at the time, at least in my area. So I now find myself running a small uh, martial arts school for Sistama in Manhattan. And um, it's a great deal of fun. There's a lot of camaraderie. Um, I would consider it a very, very minor part of my income, but a big part of my uh, interest. And I hope to continue to uh, teach and more importantly learn the Sistema for a long period of time. It's important always to maintain some level of training uh, or I think, for me, I'll, I'll start to lose uh, what I had and, and start to get really stale and, and uh, then, I, then I'm, not, uh, I'm not practicing my martial arts anymore. I'm, I'm kind of resting on my laurels and, and uh, I don't, I don't, for me that's not really a good idea. So. Um, it's helped me focus on many things. It has helped me to deal with everyday situations knowing that I have like, a therapy after work I can go to. Much better. I, I, I know a lot of good people and uh, I stay out of the trouble because when you train, when you're training for fight, you feel more confidence and that's uh, when you stay out of the trouble because it's the same thing. You're walking down the street and you see a kid, you know, say a bad thing to you. He's just a kid and I'm going to fight him. That's the same thing we, when we, we know something, we know how to fight. So 
We don't really care about what people say to you. So you made you a better person overall. Yeah, much better. I mean, I stay out of trouble and everything. So so good to train, and I feel so much better. So in so many ways, <laughs> I can't even uh, definitely quantify them. It'd be very difficult to uh, to try to put some you know some values and stuff that that uh, and how the martial arts has changed me, um, given me. Uh, you know, an, uh, an opportunity to um, have a, a living. Um, it has uh, given me a, a forum in which I can, you know, touch people's lives, affect them, have them grow. Um, you know, a lot of things that uh, teachers do. Um, it definitely has affected the way I deal with people. Um, I think when I was a young, you know, uh, younger, when I started in the martial arts, I was a bit hot-tempered, and um, you know, being uh, in the martial arts has definitely helped me, uh, you know, help me with that. You know, I'm much more patient. Um, I think it's helped me definitely to become a better person, and uh, you know, it's definitely um, it's part of me. And there's just no way, no two ways about it. I am, you know, without the martial arts, I think that uh, I would have a really difficult time with uh, my life. But you know, I'm sure I would find something. But it would, it would be a very, very difficult thing to to replace in, in my life. Bob, my name's Andrew, African American, seeking political political asylum in your country. And uh, 23 years old, full of shit. <laughs> <laughs>